Uh, I'm super excited uh, to be providing this lecture right now. Things are changing in the prostate cancer world. Uh, we have new therapies coming on board, so conventional medicine is actually getting better with time. Uh, the changes in radiation in the last few years have been, just been phenomenal. And so the guys that I'm about to treat in the next few years are going to have higher chances of cure. There are new molecules coming on board for more advanced disease. So it's a very exciting time. The urologists and the uh, medical oncologists are quite excited. There's a big buzz here. But I'm also excited because of um, the fact that the complementary world is now being researched in a very scientific fashion. I first gave my first public lecture ever about cancer in 1993 when I was a resident doctor in uh, Ottawa and um, I was super excited about it. It was for a prostate cancer group and I talked to them about the psychological aspects and what they could do to empower themselves but I was uncomfortable because I didn't have the scientific data to actually say these are the things that make a difference and over the last 20 years the scientific community is actually measuring these things very precisely, the molecules, the herbs, the vitamins that actually make a difference. And they're actually following tens of thousands of men over years and years and years to find out what prevents prostate cancer, which guys do better because of what they're doing. And so I can now present to you, which is really my purpose tonight, an integrated and practical approach to the cancer diagnosis that gives you the best chance of recovery of cure or longevity, however it's going to be for you. So I can actually present you something. And the fact is you can make a difference. You can actually influence your outcome, your quality of life, your energy. And so this talk can actually make a huge difference in, in, terms, of, um, in, in terms of how you do in the world. So I want to empower you with that information, both from the conventional medical system perspective, how to get the best care from that side of it, but also everything else you can do to empower yourselves, levels of body and mind. So this is the overview of uh, the talk. Uh, so I'm going to cover all of these uh, topics uh, this evening, and then we're going to accept uh, questions uh, afterwards. The first thing is, this is the graph of when cancers happen in men, and you can see from about age 50, that there's a huge spike in the number of cancers that are diagnosed, prostate cancers that are diagnosed. One in six men were going to have cancer. Heck, if you take a look at all 70-year-olds and look at their prostate gland, 70% of them would have cancer cells in their prostate gland. So there's a huge number. So we want to try to figure out why that's happening and what you can do to help prevent that from happening and apply those same principles if you've had a prostate cancer diagnosis. You can also see from this uh, graph up here that prostate cancer is the number one cancer in men accounting for 25 percent of all cancer diagnoses in men and it's the number three killer. In, in 2011 in Canada 26,000 men were diagnosed with prostate cancer and about 4,000 died of it means that five out of six guys survive their cancer fine on average and one guy out of six actually dies of it. So this talk is about keeping you in the former category. If you had a cancer diagnosis, how do you minimize your chance that it's going to cause you a significant problem in your life? So this is what the lecture is tonight. The take home message, what I want you to walk away with is this idea. If you have cancer cells in your body, you don't want those slow growing cells to turn into fast growing cells. You don't want your cancer to speed up in a sense. And the idea is that it's damage to the normal cells that produces ca cancer cells in the first place and it's further damage to the, the, the slow growing cells that create the fast growing cells. So you want to kind of change the chemicals in your body to stop the damage from happening. In a sense change the soup that creates the cancer cells in the first place. And so the idea is what's good in prevention of cancer is going to be good for you who are in fall after cancer diagnosis. And the alternative or the corollary is if this health habit is known to cause cancer then you want to avoid it. You want to actually change that hormonal milieu. And we go back to this by looking at kind of the biology of how cancer is created in the first place. So what is prostate cancer? 
prostate cancer occurs when some of the normal cells in the prostate begin to uh, grow in an uncontrolled way. And each man's cancer is different because there are, uh, it takes dozens of changes in a normal cell to create a cancer cell. Each cancer has a different personality or different biology. So you really can't compare yourself. Here's a diagram. Essentially the cell has uh, a center which is the brain and then a set of instructions like an instruction manual which are the words and sentences, the DNA. The words and sentences tell the cell how to act. And also from basic biology, when we look at this, when the cells divide, you start with a parent cell and it creates two daughter cells. It's the same control center, the same book of instructions. So uh, uh, an abnormal cell will keep on passing on its words and sentences to the subsequent generations. And so how are prostate cancer cells made in the first place? So it's a normal cell with many mistakes. And those mistakes can happen in three ways. You can be born with those mistakes, which is extremely rare for prostate cancer. For the most part, if you live long enough, your cells are going to continue to grow and turn over and it's going to create mutations, which is a damage or a change in the words and sentences. So that's the second thing that causes uh, the cells to change. And the third thing is, if you're exposed to toxins in your body, those also create damage. They're also called oxidants. Uh, and so a fatty diet, for instance, those who are exposed to Agent Orange or even firefighters are exposed to those type of chemicals that cause the damage that contribute to the normal cell um, um, uh, contrib uh, going to a prostate cancer cell. I'll just take a quick break to say for those listening at home, you can call uh, the 1-855 number uh, in order to uh, call in your questions which I'll address at the end of the lecture and the number is 1-855-223-5455 it's also on the website again at healingandcancer.tv you can actually see it in that first page and again you can email in your questions at any time so, uh, so those are the ways that cancer cells can be created and those are the things that we want to try to prevent from making cancer cells grow more, more, about, more quickly. So I'll give you an example how a word or a sentence get changes and you go from a kind of normal cell into a more of aggressive cell. So if the uh, sentences uh, in the words and the chromosomes read stop dividing after coming in contact with the lining of the prostate gland and that's changed. So it goes from that normal thing and it's changed to keep dividing after you come in contact with the lining. You can see that you've lost the breaks on the system. Those cells will continue to grow with time. So one becomes two becomes four. Another example of how the words and sentences within the cell can change is if it, uh, if it says, you know, you can grow slowly if testosterone is on the receptor or testosterone is there and that's changed to grow quickly if testosterone's there, then there's that signal to say keep on dividing, keep on multiplying. So the cell will keep dividing with time. So what is prostate cancer? It's, it's a cell that has begun to grow in a fast and uncontrolled way. It requires dozens of mistakes and the cells can actually start to penetrate into the tissue and can get into either the lymph system or the bloodstream float around, land somewhere else in the body and grow a colony. So that's called metastasis. That's a definition of what cancer can do if we let it get too aggressive or too far along. And here's a schema here. So you're starting with a normal cell up top and as the generations, you know, you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, as the decades going by, slowly these cells continue to divide and multiply. There's more and more damage to finally you've developed uh, a cancer cell, which is the prostate cancer cell. And that's even a very slow growing cell. We don't want this one to start, really start to replicate and get out into the bloodstream and so on. So risk factors. So what causes this big blip here in the you know, men in their 50s, 60s and 70s? If you live long enough, the cells will begin to break down and we are chronically exposed to testosterone over the years which is the prime to keep us go growing. Family history is a risk factor, not just the environment but a uh, first degree relative may put our genetics at risk of cancer. If you have two first degree relatives you're really increasing your risk. 
And the last one that we're going to talk about extensively is about diet and what you can do to empower yourself from a diet perspective as well. So those are the risk factors there. And I've shown in a diagram up here that uh, men with African heritage from the States have the highest incidence. We believe that's related to testosterone. Uh, but also you can see that uh, Caucasian men and men from Canada have a high risk relative to the numbers at the bottom, Japan, India, China, very low risk. When men emigrate from those eastern countries to North America, they actually increase their risk of developing cancer. And almost certainly it's due to diet and whether other ever uh, environmental exposures. So we can learn from that uh, as well. Here's the long list of things that we should think about that is, from a scientific perspective, proven to increase the risk of prostate cancer. So animal fats, if we eat red meat, especially if it's well done, kind of the barbecue charcoal situation, dairy products in excess, trans fats, if our diet's low in vegetables, then we don't have the antioxidants to mop up those more dangerous chemicals. Luckily, I'm just added that you can have a couple beers per night and not <laughs> risk yourself, but beyond that, you start to risk it. And interestingly, um, vitamin supplementation with folic acid and zinc actually increases the risk of cancer. You're actually turning on the machinery somehow to increase your, your chance of uh, developing more cells. This one's very important as well. It's probably related to uh, a sugary diet and a high, high calorie diet. It's clearly the abdominal fat is a risk factor. So the more the weight, the higher the risk. Um, and the higher the risk that you're gonna have a faster growing and more aggressive cancer. So you have a different hormonal milieu in, by having too much weight on. And I talk about this one as well in terms of sugary diets. When you have that big sugar fix at lunchtime, you send a whole bunch of insulin into your bloodstream which sets off a whole bunch of other chemicals that cause the cells to turn over and grow faster. And that's probably one of the main factors, the sugary foods there. And they've done lots of studies where they actually measure kind of uh, glucose type of levels in men and watch them for decades. The guys that are having high sugary diets are at much higher risk of developing prostate cancer. Again, something to avoid. So again, big picture, don't perturb the cells. Don't change those slow growing cells over to faster growing cells. What's good in prevention is good if you had a diagnosis. What's bad in terms of causing cancer is something that we should be avoiding, especially as a society. Think about your kids, your family, where we can actually change this over help prevent prostate cancers in the first place. The point though is it takes dozens of uh, changes in the cell before you actually see a cancer cell. And you, one man cannot actually compare himself to another man. Each cancer has a slightly different personality. And the fact is no matter where you sit then, you can always do way better than accepted as well. So how does the tumor grow? So you start out with one cell, it starts to duplicate one, becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. You have some cells uh, dying at the same time. And so typically in prostate cancer, which is a very slow growing cancer compared with most other cancers, the doubling time is about one to three years in terms of how quickly a lump can grow. Which means you have all that extra time to change your diet and have an influence on those cells over the years. In a single tip of my finger, one centimeter cubed is a billion cells. That's a lot of cells, right, in a single go. And so they're extremely small as well. How do they cause problems? I have a diagram here showing that if you get a swelling in the prostate gland, it's going to block off the tube and get urinary problems. The cancer could get into the lymph system, could spread to the bones, can affect a person's energy. So that's how the cells grow and spread and cause problems with time. So PSA, as you know, uh, is a chemical that's produced by both the normal cells and prostate cancer cells. And if the normal cells get inflamed, the PSA can go up and that can kind of make the, the waters a bit murky as to where it's going. So whether you have cancer cells present or not, and why the PSA can bounce around a little bit. Some of these concepts that are important to understand. PSA for screening, there's the controversies around that. Screening is only for well men. Men who have symptoms need to see their doctors right away. 
And my, my view is every man from age 40, if they have any risk factors, or definitely age 50, should at least talk to their family doctor about the pros and cons of screening. I think we need to make that message clear for everybody, all men within our society. Once there's a cancer diagnosis, the PSA is extremely valuable. The screening questions, the controversy, that's totally different than somebody who's had a cancer diagnosis and their PSA is extremely helpful in measuring how the disease is going and actually can tell what's happening years in advance. The PSA blood test does not localize where the cancer cells are coming from though. Right? So you can have some PSA coming from the prostate gland, but if there are cells elsewhere, they will also secrete that same PSA into the bloodstream. Right? So you can't tell from a PSA test where the cancer is, except in some circumstances when the PSA rises extremely quickly or is extremely high. So making the diagnosis, I want to, just a few other concepts in terms of making the, their decision. So you take a biopsy, you're taking a very small piece of tissue. It's about a centimeter long by about a millimeter in diameter. And so it's a very tiny percentage of the overall prostate gland. And the point is that a first biopsy could actually miss some cancer cells there. The other thing is that there may be cancer cells there that are more aggressive than you expect. And that's the difficulty with a biopsy. And this is what a biopsy looks like. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see there's these little tiny pieces of tissue under a powerful microscope on the, on the left side of the stream. You can see that there is actually these cells that are right in the middle, actually abnormal. And that's a Gleason score, sorry, Gleason grade three out of five, in that particular slide. I want to tell you quickly Gleason score because it can be confusing. It's a score out of 10. It's made up of two grades, each out of five. The first grade is the most common type of cancer they see on those slides. The second grade is the second most common. So a Gleason score six is usually a very slow growing cancer. A Gleason score eight or nine or 10 is a faster growing cancer and seven is in the middle between the two. Stage cancer, it's what the doctor feels in the rectal examination. T1C means you can't feel a lump. T2 is the lump is within the prostate gland itself. T3, the lump has broken through the capsule or the lining of the prostate gland. The PSAs are artificially broken up into less than 10, 10 to 20, and greater than 20. And how quickly that PSA increased in the years coming up to the diagnosis. Then there's the Gleason score, but also how much cancer is actually seen within the prostate itself. It's a lot of cancer and many cores, a lot of percentage and so on. And then in the more advanced situations, even when it's potentially curable, they may or may not order a bone scan or a CAT scan. What you're going to see in the next few years, you're actually going to start measuring the genetics, meaning what are the words and sentences within the biopsy that uh, are abnormal. And that will help predict how uh, these guys are going. I show a picture of a bone scan here. Essentially what it is, it's a radioactive substance that goes into the bloodstream, circulates everywhere, but gets picked up by the bones that are growing and changing. So arthritis can actually have some bones that are growing and changing, but cancer also lights up quite brightly. I show this picture partly because a bone scan could be completely normal, but there could be some cancer cells there. And so I show that also as a schema here, a cross-section of bone with a single cancer cell. There's no way a bone scan or a CAT scan, an MRI, and PET scan is not helpful in this situation. So the point is, even if things look like they're going perfect, you might have some cancer cells in your body, and yet another reason to continue on that course of taking care of yourself and not portraying those cells. And hopefully you'll be cured in the long term. Just some quick quick language, I want to talk about active surveillance. It's watching the PSA blood test when there, there's a known cancer there and doing a rebopsy every couple of years with the idea that if things worsen somehow that we would jump on to the curative type of treatment. So surgery or putting some seeds in the prostate or, or whatever. Um, this is an excellent option for guys who have slow growing cancers whose life expectancy is less than 10 to 15 years. So if they have got bad heart disease and they're maybe 75 years old. This is a great option here. 
But yet again, it's an opportunity not to perturb the cells, to take care of yourself with diet and exercise, etc. So don't turn the slow-growing cells into fast-growing cells, no matter what's the situation. Um, here's an operation, the radical prostatectomy. I has specific side effects. Urinary incontinence is, is a risk. Erectile dysfunction maybe in 40%. Essentially, it removes the gland. I think it's a great option for guys who have a high chance where the cells, the cancer cells, are likely restricted to the prostate gland. There are some other situations in which, uh, you know, high-risk guys will have an operation as well. But essentially, I like the, the operation itself, partly because it provides more information. Remember, the biopsy is only the sampling, and the operation gives a lot more information because they'll chop up the prostate gland and look at all of it underneath the microscope. So it really is a good operation. Radiation can be used after an operation if, if there's a high risk that there are some cancer cells left over there. But we don't do the reverse, and I'll talk to you about that in a, in a moment. So it's another reason why you, you can go with operation first if you're the right candidate. A PSA after the operation should be zero, or actually it should be zero, but the lab measures it as undetectable or less than a certain value. An undetectable PSA does not mean that there are no cancer cells in the body. Um, hopefully there aren't, but there even could be a few hundred cells there without before the PSA actually starts to become visible. If the PSA rises and continues to rise after an operation, that means that there are cancer cells in the body. We just can't tell where they are. PSA after radiotherapy. In some circumstances, PSA gives such a high dose, it kills off all the normal cells as well. But for the most part, the PSA will still be detectable. Um, and the PSA can bounce around a little bit afterwards because if there's any inflammation of the normal tissue, that will cause the PSA to rise and fall with time. Um, a PSA um, of greater than two points from its lowest, so it goes from down to 0.5, if the PSA rises up to 2.5, then we say the cancer has come back. It's rare to recommend uh, surgery or even cryotherapy after radiation because radiation causes some damage, some scarring, some narrowing of the blood vessels, and it puts guys at much, much higher risk of having damage from the sec uh, subsequent uh, treatment. Um, the PSA after hormone treatments, essentially the hormones will starve the cancer cells and the normal prostate cells of the testosterone. And that disables the cells or kills off probably 99% of the cells uh, there. Um, sometimes those hormones are given part of a curative plan, the idea that it might kill off the last uh, of the cancer cells that are floating about. As the hormones wear off, the testosterone levels come up and the person's PSA levels could come up and that doesn't necessarily mean that there are cancer cells uh, there. Uh, hormone therapy, if it's just given by itself, is not meant to cure men. It's meant to put the cancer in uh, remission. Just a quick uh, plug for my radiation colleagues. Putting radioactive seeds right into the prostate gland is good in certain situations in which it's highly likely the cancer cells are just there. It's a very high cure rate, similar to uh, surgery, if you choose your specialist well. Same with uh, having an operation. You want somebody who has experience and very good at their job. That actually makes a difference. And the side effects, uh, again, it's the radioactivity is there for six months or so. Here's just a regular x-ray of a prostate gland. You can see the seeds in the, that area. And they actually make a nice little pattern around the outside edge of uh, the prostate itself. And that creates radiation right into uh, the prostate gland. Radiation is also, uh, external radiation is also an excellent option. The last couple of years, just it's amazing what's happened with the technology there. So it, it can treat a, l a larger area. Cancer cells that have gone beyond the lining can also be sterilized by external radiation. It has its own set of side effects uh, as well. There's a radiation machine aiming the radiation at the patient. It rotates around and aims from different directions. Ultimately, it creates a distribution of radiation that hits the prostate itself and tries to spare as much of the normal tissue as possible. And there's a whole bunch of big words, big names for this type of radiation treatment. 
they're all doing the same thing. Super high dose to the, the, uh, the prostate and the tumor and really minimize the dose around to the normal tissues like the rectum. Treatment for cure, uh, hormones are often added uh, for anywhere between six months and three years. It actually increases the cure rate by about five to 10% by going through that time. And I tell you because the hormones have their own side effects and you can do something about some of those side effects as well. I want to tell you about a story of a guy I saw recently in follow-up. Uh, a very nice gentleman of 70 year olds when I first met him uh, four years ago. He's an executive. His PSA had been rising. Uh, the original biopsy showed a fast growing cancer, Gleason score 9. A lump was felt in the prostate area and he decided to go on a clinical trial so thank him for uh, doing that and that put him on two years of hormones and full dose radiation and we we had a special part we actually gave him some chemotherapy during the actual um, treatment itself his PSA went down and remained undetectable for four years and then uh, in May of this year the PSA first began to go up at 0.07 his testosterone was close to the normal range at that point. His examination was normal. He was having a great time in his life. And then I just saw him a week ago or so, PSA up to 0.15. The testosterone level was the same, so I knew that the PSA was increasing because of something. And I actually believed that it was cancer that was causing the PSA to go up. He had a faster doubling time of six months in this situation. And I basically said to him, I think your cancer has come back. Uh, it's not by definition yet, but that's my experience in this situation. My, and I basically said to him, this is the plan. I'm going to wait until the PSA gets greater than 10 or 15. And that's about six doubling times in order to get there. So that's three years that we're going to wait and see before we're actually going to intervene. Then when the PSA gets there, I'm going to start him on hormone treatments. And I expect the hormone treatments to hold the cancer in check for probably three to five years. And then once the cancer grows despite the hormone treatments, he would be a good candidate for some chemotherapy. He's a very strong fellow, and that can actually prolong life for a few years, usually with a fairly good quality life for at least half of it. The point is, if you look at his whole situation, looking back to 2007 and what's projected into the future, he has many years of life to live. So from here, I'm predicting about 10 years, and that's a worst case scenario. 10 years in which he can influence his health by doing the things I'm gonna talk about. I don't want his cancer to become more aggressive with time. Uh, and he can do something for side effects and overall quality of life. And so I wanna talk about hormone treatment as well, because this is a very important uh, part of it. And I wanna uh, uh, thank Dr. Shabir uh, alibi from Toronto who shared with me the most recent data. So we know that it causes a lo loss of sex drive and that there are erectile dysfunction because of the testosterone. There's not a whole bunch that we can do around that, but there are many other side effects you can influence. For instance, hot flushes, if you have a problem with it, there are medications and ways, ways to work with it. And then here's the long list of uh, possible side effects. And again, there's many things that you can do about it, and I'm gonna go into a few of these. Point is, you wanna connect with your family physician so they can measure these things in your blood to find out you know, whether they need to be modified, and especially around bone loss and osteoporosis and bone health in general, extremely important. So osteoporosis and fractures. The point is that the hormone therapy thins the bones over time. And so you lose about two to 5% of your bone density in the first year of hormone treatments, and it continues to drop off with time. And that hits all the bones in the body, so therefore we're at risk of this. When a person comes off their hormone therapy, there can be some recovery, but it's not a full recovery. And it's partly why you should be on your vitamin D and calcium right now today to keep your bones strong before you run into these type of problems. And this is a, a schema of normal bone on the left side. And you can see that as you get into osteoporosis, the quality of the bone decreases, the strength of the bone decreases, and a person's at risk of fracture, collapsing their backbone or breaking a hip. And this is the normal, this is a slide of the normal 
changes in bone mass. You can see the guys from about age 40 start to lose bone mass over the years. This is accelerated if you get started onto hormone therapy where your, where your bone mineral density falls off quickly uh, with time. So the takeaway point, calcium and vitamin D, it's a thousand international units uh, of, of calcium daily. In Canada, we simply do not get enough sun. And so from probably 10 months a year, you need to be taking vitamin D. Calcium from all sources, about 1,200 milligrams. The other thing that you sh is a takeaway point for each and every one of you is you should have your bone density measured if you're going to start onto hormone therapy. Right at the start and then every one to two years afterwards. Because if, you, if your bones are getting too thin, there's something we can do to help you in terms of building it up again. Um, guys lose strength as well. They lose their muscle. Uh, and you, actually the tests show that small percentage of difference. Again, something you can do by working out, you can maintain your strength and energy here. The guys that I'm seeing in the, in the day to day will complain that they're just not quite as sharp sometimes in the hormone treatment. So at least 50% of the guys will have uh, some, decline, some measurable decline. It's usually very mild, oftentimes related to three dimensional thinking, but also higher executive function is a potential side effect uh, from that. The intermittent hormone treatments can uh, work, once the cancers become incurable, like my gentleman that I'm treating now, can become incurable, uh, but intermittent hormones work just as well as having the hormone therapy all the time. It's typically given as three injections or nine months of treatment, and then we watch to see what happens uh, to the PSA. PSA will typically go down to close to zero, and then we stop the hormone therapy and watch and wait what happens, and it's usually two years, two and a half years before the PSA gets up again. We do the same thing. PSA goes down. It's typically a year, year and a half before it comes up again. And slowly the intervals get smaller. But in the meantime, we have bought a lot of time uh, uh, for, the, for and usually with very good quality of life. Ultimately, if the hormone therapy no longer works, then it becomes what they call castrate resistant prostate cancer. And um, and so the intermittent hormone therapy does work very well for a certain period of time. I just want to talk about castrate resistance. So even after they've been through uh, all the hormone therapy, prednisone, withdrawal of hormones, the cancer continues to grow. Um, and the standard is to provide a chemotherapy um, for men who are strong enough uh, to get through it. But I also want to say that we have new molecules, new types of treatment coming on and that means uh, that you really should see the medical oncologist, the cancer specialist, once you're in that situation, even if you're not interested in kind of classic strong chemotherapy. The options are coming open and this is why it's ex an exciting time for us. The first uh, chemotherapy from 1994 didn't work as well. 2004 is the standard docetaxel uh, right now, but in 2009, 10, 11 we have all these new agents coming on board. And it's exciting because we want to take those new treatments and apply them to guys who have potentially curable cancer up front. And so it's a plea for men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer to go on to clinical trials so that we can learn and get better treatments with time. We're, we're about 30 years behind what's happened in breast cancer. Now we've got some actual treatments that can make a difference uh, here. So standard is taxotere chemotherapy given every three weeks along with some prednisone, which is a steroid. And it does have particular side effects, can lower the blood counts, put men at risk of uh, infection. They can have hair loss, they can have some numbness in their fingers and toes, and there are other side effects. But you really want to have a good conversation about the pros and cons. And this survival curve here, uh, the yellow one is the chemotherapy up top and the uh, black one at the bottom is the older type of chemotherapy. It doesn't seem like a big survival difference between the two sides, but I can tell you if you're a guy who's responding to this new chemotherapy, then your quality of life can vastly improve and still 20% of the guys are alive three years uh, later in this kind of uh, difficult scenario. Um, and what's exciting is this new type of treatment. It's a new pill called Zytiga. It's a special type of hormone therapy, has much less side effects uh, than chemotherapy. It's given as a pill once daily along with prednisone. 
and it's much easier overall than chemotherapy. There are particular side effects that the doctors have to monitor, like high blood pressure and retention and so on. And the hope is we'll take the newer medications right up front when we're first trying to cure the guys. So that's when we're going to make the breakthrough. So please enroll in those clinical trials. Uh, and here's a, a graph of uh, patients who have this incurable type of cancer. They're given this new type of hormone treatment and have much better survival by uh, a few months. And again, the guys who are responding feel better or happier and so on. The other thing I want to say is if you get into the situation in which the cancer spread to the bone, then it's probably worth going on a bone builder. And that's essentially something that helps fend off the osteoporosis as well as the complications as the bone is being kind of eaten away at that. So you get a better outcome, less chance of running into bad complications. People still need to take their calcium and vitamin D. Now the last part of the talk, I want to talk about what you can do from a bigger perspective. So far the talk has been informational, which is very, very important, but now this is a process, how to negotiate the medical system, how to get yourself the best care, how to advocate for yourself, and then how to empower yourself. Some very practical advice here as well. So the purpose of the information is to allow you to uh, speak the language of the medical system so that you'll understand what your doctor is recommending and why, and when you can advocate for yourself, you'll feel better. Ultimately, you'll get better care. You'll actually get better conventional care by understanding the system. And then you can also empower yourself with information around the kind of non-medical or the complementary part of this. I worry about some of the guys who are up late at night on the internet looking at all these fancy dancy treatments that don't pertain to them and burning themselves out and tying themselves out. So if you're getting too much information or it's tiring you, then you really want to talk to your physician, talk to your specialist who will help, um, help uh, guide you. Uh, the best source of the information is actually your physician or specialist. They will put the context, all the special treatments within context for you with time. But you want to prepare for those conversations. So sources of information. I'm going to tell you at every step in the game to talk to an expert. Who is the expert in information? So what I would suggest is it's probably the librarian at the cancer center at the hospital. I know Prostate Cancer Canada can delve into and get you all sorts of information that can help guide your decisions. Canadian Cancer Society also has a free 188 number, send you a package or email you a package. So go to those sources, get the information early, understand your care, it can make a huge difference uh, in your health. So learn to advocate for yourself and you do that by preparing, by uh, recognizing when you don't have enough information and drawing on the extra services. If you don't ask for it, you're not going to know about it. Uh, you may not necessarily get it. So first thing is, before the visit itself, you want to prepare. So have your questions written down, bring in your, uh, your symptoms, your medications, your allergies, have somebody come with you because it's normal to feel a bit stressed talking to the doc there. So they can be the actual recorder. I also think you should have your own file of medical information. You are in, you're legally entitled to all of it. All your PSA results, all your consultation notes, your pathology report. You have the package there. Too many times I've been sitting in the cancer center not having the information and one of my patients actually says, well I actually have that PSA, I actually have that report. I can take a photocopy, it helps there and speed things along. So I really think you should record and uh, have that available for yourself. At the visit, you need to be open and honest about it, but also recognize if you're feeling confused or if your doctor is speaking too quickly or you know, you're having problems understanding. You need to stop them and say, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Can you please repeat that? So recognize the fact is you're the most important person in the office, not your urologist or your oncologist. So you want to be there for them. Take notes, have somebody take notes, bring a recorder. I, I think that's a great way to, uh, to capture the, the information. And uh, ultimately find out what to expect, what to, uh, how you need to act, uh, when and what circumstances. After the visit, keep your journal, ask for a family meeting, meeting if need be. Um, 
and advocate for yourself. When you feel like you're not understanding what's happening, keep on calling. The squeaky wheel gets the grease in the sick room sense. You are entitled to a second opinion. Sometimes if you're seeing a urologist first, trying to make that first decision, you should probably talk with a radiation oncologist about the options. And how you do that is ask your family doctor to refer you or talk to the nurse of the doctor that you're working with and she can help uh, that happen as well. This is an important slide. The medical system has a lot of information, a lot of services. And if you don't talk to them, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to necessarily get it because your doctor will forget to refer you to these specialists. So I'm going to talk about diet, but the first thing you should be thinking to yourself is, I need to talk to a specialist. I need to talk to a nutritionist of running to psychological problems or whatever it is. Somebody's there who can help uh, guide you in the process. I do want to say that it's normal to be frustrated and angry and upset at some point in your journey. Uh, is best to find somebody at least to share your emotions with and what's happening with. Things change and just be kind to yourself. If things are getting you know, more upsetting, guys, I mean, one in five of us are going to run into a major depression in our lifetime. So when do you really need that extra help? So overly depressed, withdrawing, not functioning, too distressed to figure out what you want to do. Those are all normal things that can happen. But that's the point where you want to actually talk to a specialist whether it's your family doctor, or a psychologist, or social worker, to actually help you through a difficult time. Uh, and so you can talk to your family physician, you can talk to the counselor at the cancer center, you can drop in and so on. Support groups are an excellent venue for letting some of those emotions uh, out. Uh, I do want to again just plug Prostate Cancer Canada. It's an excellent medium for guys who are in your situation. You've got an amazing staff and and infrastructure that's going to continue to expand and really provide those great services. And it really does improve quality of life. Networking, you actually learn how to negotiate the medical system. You learn how to do this to get yourself the best possible uh, care. Okay, takeaway points, absolutely necessary. I usually say exercise, 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 which is extremely important, but I actually put diet up above that because you want to kind of change the soup you don't want the cancer cells to continue to grow and change with time. It's the same idea. So your vitamin D actually has anti proliferative activity, actually slows down uh, cell turnover. Calcium, omega-3 is a uh, uh, anti-inflammatory as well. Again, we don't want the irritation or the damage from uh, within, within the blood system. So omega-3 is in, in essential. Exercise, 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 maintain a healthy weight, sleep in the dark, practice a relaxation technique. You actually change your physiology by practicing relaxation. Your brain will continue to grow and change with time no matter what age you are. So relaxation and doing that is extremely important even though I'm not going to spend the time on that. So nutrition, so we're going to go nutrition first. Again, talk to a professional especially if you're having uh, problems uh, uh, with your diet. You really can empower yourself. I thought that when I first read this uh, 20 years ago, I thought the Canada Food Guide was pretty fluffy, not really scientifically based. But over the last 20 years, I've been convinced that that diet is actually the best diet. Multiple food groups, healthiness, the cruciferous vegetables, so broccoli, cauliflower, are the antioxidants that are most helpful in prostate cancer. So that's a, a neutrochemical in some sense lower your fat, high fiber, healthy fluids. Those are all super important in, in your journey. This is a, um, a, a slide provided by Inspire Health. It's a fantastic um, uh, integrative center in Vancouver. And they're quoting uh, Dr. Uh, David uh, Servan Schraber, who's a psychiatrist who researched this with uh, Richard Beliveau in Montreal. And they actually use the chemicals from these kind of superfoods and put them into test tubes with prostate cancer cells to see which foods inhibited the cells the uh, most. And these are the, the superfoods that they identified in his, uh, in, in, his, well, in his kind of groundbreaking book, uh, Anti-Cancer. I do want to say, that, and just a flash through this, when there is a healthy way to live your life, you can see this presentation on the website healingandcancer.tv. Actually, the, all of the slides will be there so you can go to the websites. But there's breakfast that's quite healthy. Here's some options for lunch. 
uh, and supper. Uh, you know, so you really can change your diet and have an influence uh, there. Taking your vitamins, your vitamins are extremely important, your omega-3 dose, calcium, vitamin D. A healthy diet really should provide the rest. So that's an important uh, part of it. I can't overemphasize how important exercise is. And it improves energy, um, mood, uh, sleep. Uh, it really does change your physiology uh, in so many different ways. It releases the happy hormones. So quality of life goes up. And I'll tell you the quick story. Um, so uh, about a year ago, I came in, he was in his late 70s, still running his own business, so he's still working, and he's about to start hormone treatments for his prostate cancer, where he's in a curative uh, uh, pathway. And he said to me, what can I do to mitigate against the fatigue that I get from the hormone therapy? And I said to him, exercise, exercise, exercise. And he's one of the few guys that really took it to heart. He started working out at the local gym. He started making some friends who were like 40 years his, his, uh, his junior. And he said that on the days that he was working out, it was as if when he was working out, the blood was being pushed up into his brain and oxygenating his brain. He was so much brighter and crisper and had more energy on the days that he exercised. And I really think that that's the pattern. Exercise converts to energy. It's the meta message that says your body wants to grow and heal and so on. And so the data shows that the guys that exercise vigorously for three hours a week or more have less chance of developing prostate cancer than the guys that exercise less than that. So that's a prevention idea. And what we're talking about is also resistance training. So you can increase your strength, increase your balance. And so I just highly, highly endorse exercise as the minimum health habit. We'll just touch on briefly complementary medicine. The idea is uh, those things offered outside of traditional medicine. And what I want you to say is do your research, figure out if it makes sense, trust your intuition, tell your doctor what you're doing, and don't forego the proven stuff. So conventional medicine is what we practice within the medical system. Essentially, your doc should be talking about the risks and benefits of each treatment, allowing you to decide what you want to do. And because of these kind of medical breakthroughs, we have higher cure rates in a prost uh, prostate cancer. So that's complementary medicine broken down, body, mind, biologicals, energy systems. The disadvantage of it is it can be expensive. Some practitioners will give false or unproven claims and especially if guys are running into problems with prostate cancer. And you can, and the, these websites actually tell you about how the complementary medicines could potentially interact with the medications that are given by the medical system. So we worry about the side effects from the two of those. So there's a potential disadvantage uh, there. What you want to ask your complementary provider is, uh, what's the quality of their training? What's the evidence? that this, the treatment, their herb, or whatever they're recommending actually works. So you want to look at the quality of that evidence. Is it documented? What's the interaction? Benefit and risk always, and cost. Bottom line is, in the last 10 years, the major cancer centers in the States and internationally have looked at every single molecule to find out if there's some herb that actually is the knockout punch for prostate cancer. Nothing has made a difference from the, the complementary perspective. And that's summarized in this one document, the Society of Integrative Oncology, all these physicians coming together. And I'm going to give you the recommendation, which is essentially to improve quality of life in some circumstances, but not cure rates. So for instance, massage can definitely help with uh, anxiety and pain. Um, meditation visualization can help with pain and you know, quality of sleep, improves quality of life, and decreases stress. So these things actually change quality of life. I'm not dismissing it from that perspective. I'm just saying it's not going to add to cure rates. So Reiki, the idea that the energy system around our body and within our system has been proven to decrease stress and enhance quality of life. Acupuncture, kind of from a Chinese medicine perspective, creates uh, vital energy and flow. Actually does release neurotransmitters, chemistries, chemicals within the system affects our immune system, blood pressure. Again, not a cure. Uh, just <laughs> an example of early acupuncture. The elephant thinking to himself, that's all, my neck suddenly feels better. Um, and so acupuncture has been uh, recommended 
uh, in terms of pain, nausea, dry mouth, hot flushes. So again, randomized high quality trials showing that these type of things help in quality of uh, life. There are the biologicals. Again, there's no knockout uh, here. And I've quoted some, met, uh, some websites that you can access uh, later to actually look at each of the individual molecules. So again, they're investigating these proactively with time. Here are some great uh, websites. So the BC uh, government of uh, USA uh, has many websites that look at each of these therapies in turn and look at the quality of the evidence uh, there. I'm going to leave you, this is the, the last part of the presentation, it's one study done by Dean Ornish from UCLA who showed that actually cardiovascular disease can actually be reversible in some cases, so they actually go from a narrowed artery to a larger artery. He did this with prostate cancer, essentially took 93 men uh, who had an early prostate cancer, uh, they were on active surveillance, meaning they were being watched to see if they needed to actually have their surgery or their radiation. The experimental arm was what I call the full meal deal. So they were taught stress reduction, they changed their diet to a low fat vegan diet with some antioxidants, exercise and group support. They did everything to try to help themselves. The control arm, the other half of the guys said you go and guys and do whatever you think is best for yourself. They watched the PSA blood test uh, over a year, every, uh, every three months. And what they found was the guys in the control group, which essentially had to do it by themselves, their PSA on average increased 6%. And six out of the 43 guys actually had to go ahead and have their surgery or radiation. In the experimental arm, the PSA actually decreased by 4% uh, during that year. None of the guys needed their treatment. The control arm followed the diet 75% as well as the experimental arm. And yet, the control arm's PSA went up. So it wasn't just diet by itself. The second experiment they did is they actually took the serum, which is the, the kind of non-cell products out of the blood, which con contains the chemicals that surround the cells and so on, and put them into the test tube with prostate cancer cells. The guys that were really taking care of themselves 70% of the time their serum were able to inhibit prostate cancer cells from growing and only 9% in the control group. So again, you actually change the chemistry, change the soup of your blood by doing those things. The guys that followed the program more closely actually inhibit more of the cancer cells. And they were able to see that there was actually different gene expression in the normal cells in the guys that took care of themselves again. Okay, so in summary, you can empower yourself uh, and that's uh, by not letting any slow growing cells that might be there turn into fast growing cells. You need to take care of yourself so everything I've talked to you maybe your grandmother could have given to you in a single sentence as well but take care of yourself enjoy your life advocate for yourself and by doing that you actually can make a difference you can improve your outcome and definitely your quality of life. So thank you. Thanks to Peter and Prostate Cancer Canada. I really appreciate that. Jansen for uh, supporting this talk and uh, healingandcancer.org, which I lead, or healingandcancer.tv will, will have this uh, presentation available. So thanks everybody for your attention. And now for those who want to, we'll stay and uh, take some questions. So. So, any questions from the live audience? Our very extensive live audience. Hundreds of people. I'll look at way at the back over there. <laughs> so is there a particular trigger to turn slow growing into fast growing, or is it just lifestyle and exercise and diet that can maintain them slow? Right. Yeah. So the question was, uh, is there one particular thing that will change a slow growing cell into a fast growing cell? And the idea is that it's, uh, it's the total package. And it may be one element within one person. So one person's not exercising enough, or one person has a fatty diet, or one person is you know, having too much sugar in their diet, those type of things. And so if they can correct that, that might make the difference for them. But it's so individual. Uh, each cancer has dozens of mistakes, and we don't want to perturb and, and create the next mistake in that. And it is actually a very exciting time uh, because we're actually being able to look at the molecular changes that are happening in cells and how those health, healthy lifestyles actually turn the machinery around. 
So I've given you the picture of what they call the genetic changes of cancer, what's the words and sentences, but actually it's an interaction between the chemicals outside of the, the cell turning on the genes or turning on the machinery inside of the cell, for instance, what they call now epigenetics. So it's a very complicated system and that's why you want to kind of do the full meal deal to try to stop whatever is causing the damage or the change or the uh, causing the machinery to keep on growing. Is so. it reversible? Uh, do you know what? For any one person, yes, I guess that's true, but I wouldn't kind of promise it as a kind of a cure in the, in the long term. So uh, I'm just going to continue to uh, answer the four or five questions that we have here. So a call from Kitchener. Uh, the question was, I was on hormone therapy for 15 months. I stopped the hormone therapy in March. Now my PSA has started to rise from negligible now up to 0.2 to 0.4 since I stopped the hormone treatments. At what point need I be concerned over this and resume some type of treatment? So, um, so for the person in Kitchener, the idea is that they're on hormone therapy, their PSA would have gone down to zero, and now that they're off it from March, the PSA is starting to creep up again. We don't know when we should intervene, when we should start with the hormone therapy again. There was a large study in Britain that basically said if you wait until the cancer gets into your bones before you start the hormone therapy, then you, overall the length of time you live is shortened. Some doctors use six as a PSA cutoff. I think that's a bit premature. The young healthy guys, I recommend a PSA cutoff of about 10 before I'd start the hormone therapy again. And the guys that are old and frail and not, not getting through their hormones very easily, I wait till the PSA is 20. The idea is that the person can cycle through this many, many times. So nine months of hormones off for a long time, nine months of hormones off for a long time. And you start adding up the years that way, then you can really make a difference. Okay, so from Halifax, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, enlarged prostate. Will this lead to prostate cancer? I do not want to take the prescribed medicine. I'm trying to take natural supplements to help with this. I'm quite worried about the side effects of medicine that were prescribed to, uh, to reduce the enlarged prostate. Any suggestions other than medicine? Anything natural? Well, I think you know, this is the perfect situation uh, the person is at risk of a cancer. We're all, as men, at risk of having a cancer. And he's asking, there is actually a pill that actually decreases the cancer from happening, um, but it's, it, it has a very small um, benefit overall. And he's asking whether there's a natural product instead of that pill to, uh, to um, decrease cancer. Well, again, the whole lecture is around this idea that we don't want to perturb the normal cells, the inflamed cells, into cancer cells. And so there's no one kind of medication. And I've listed everything from a very, very scientific perspective, looking at all the molecules. So for instance, I didn't mention selenium. I didn't mention vitamin E. I didn't mention lycopenes and tomatoes. Because now, they have, they've, through the large studies, they've proven not to make a difference. Right? So everything that I mentioned in this whole presentation has either been shown to prevent uh, men from developing cancer on average, or reduce their risk is the way to say that, or um, it's known to be an association with causing cancer, so the fatty diet for instance. So by following all the scientifically based stuff here, I think you decrease the risk in that situation of developing uh, a new cancer. So nothing, no one pill around that. Um, Question, <clears throat> uh, after having the prostatectomy, which is having the, the gland removed, now I have incontinence, loss of sexual function and pleasure and loss of fertility. Why would you say that this is better quality of life? My point is having more years being alive doesn't justify surgery without quality of life. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and uh, obviously it's a balance. And for each man, each situation, I'm sorry that you've, you're having uh, you know, such terrible quality of life in that way. It's that balance between trying to increase the chance of cure versus taking the risk of having the side effects from this. And so that's why oftentimes we recommend active surveillance in the older guys. Some guys, and that's the other reason why I don't recommend screening for absolutely everybody, because they may decide, I don't want to go through an operation. And men are very different in what they want to do in terms of quality of life and so on. So yeah, so it's a good, it's a good point. It's, it's risk versus benefit. And uh, you know things can work out worse in terms of the side effect profile than the actual disease itself. 
Okay, question. Um, I would challenge a statement you made a few minutes ago regarding the, uh, following the Canada Food Guide. Some of these food groups are animal proteins, dairy and meat. The new information that we have from the documentary Forks Over Knives, based on a book by T. Colin Campbell, the China study released in 2005, suggests that too much protein in general, especially animal protein, overloads the immune system, depresses it, allows cancers to proliferate. The best example of this is what happened in Norway when the Nazis confiscated all the animals to feed their army. Cancer rates in Norway plummeted. After the war and things returned to normal with animals, cancer skyrocketed again. My question is, uh, I'd like you to respond to this. So it's really a good point, and I think uh, I'd say there's moderation in moderation as well. And uh, I agree with you, if we went completely vegan and uh, very low fat, et cetera, et cetera, we would probably minimize our risk. But I think a little bit from each of these other food groups, and I agree with you, decreasing the protein, uh, minimizing the protein is, uh, is, is a good idea. Big picture though is, what's the, I mean, it's like the previous question, what's the quality of life versus the quantity of life? Maybe you do, maybe you do enjoy a steak. Maybe you're gonna live with 15 years uh, eating steaks versus 20 years not eating steaks, and is the 15 years worth it? You know, so it's a quality of life question, and I agree that you know, if we had a healthier lifestyle, that we would be seeing much fewer prostate cancers. Uh, and so hats off to you for that question too. Okay, um, uh, this gentleman is 62 years old, so PSA 6.9, Gleason score 6, so it's a slow growing cancer. He says one out of 12 uh, of the cores, the samples, showed some cancer. Uh, in a very small amount of it. His prostate gland is significantly enlarged at 65 cubic centimeters. That's a big prostate gland. About 40 is a good size, and usually 40 or less is, would be something you can control seeds with. Uh, he says, I've been looking at various options, and I'm really wondering about high-intensity focused ultrasound. So you put a probe in the prostate gland, sends out these ultrasounds, kills off the normal cells, kills off the prostate cells, they're offering this out of Toronto. It seems to have positive reviews, but negative because of the limited time. So they haven't been doing this long enough to know what the long-term follow-up is. Could you provide some insight into this comment? Is, is this a worthwhile option to pursue? And that's from Chilliwack, uh, BC. So again, a great question. You really need really probably 15 year data before you can compare one treatment with another treatment, right? One was one of my meta messages today. Even after the cancer comes back, you've got probably 10 years to go. And so if a, uh, if a treatment fails, then there's this long time. And to know if there's a difference in the one therapy over another therapy, then, uh, then you need that follow up. The second thing that I think about from a radiation oncology perspective is what they call distribution. Are you getting the ultrasound in this situation to hit every single part of the cell? In the same way, are you getting a radiation to hit every part of the cell? So again, uh, uh, in a sense, I worry about that. And especially with a large uh, prostate gland of 65 cc's, you're gonna cause all this damage to all the cells and the urethra, which is the tubing, is gonna go right through that same area. And so there can be some symptoms around that as well. And I would get an opinion from somebody who's not making money off of their treatment, which is what's happening with the high food world. Uh, so I think it has to be studied in a non-biased way before I would actually uh, recommend that. So great question from Chilliwack, uh, BC. Thank you. Uh, another quick question. Uh, I'm not sure I've got the end of this one. Uh, uh, Dr. Rutledge, can the chlorine in the swimming pool cause prostate cancer? I used to swim three to four times, uh, three to five times a week. Afterwards, I've reduced the time I swim. Now I go less frequently. Really, epidemiological studies show that it doesn't increase risk. And they've looked at everything. You know, 200 scientists from around the world got together looking at all the causes of cancer. Probably up there, you know, smoking, but obesity is probably contributing about 15 to 20% of all cancers. Lack of exercise, you know, diet. We could actually change this as a society if we, uh, if we actually adopted the healthy lifestyles. Uh, but I really don't think that chlorine is a risk, and especially I like the idea that a person swimming and exercising has a much greater potential. So I think that's my biased answer on that one. So does that finish the questions? Great. So again, thank you so much to the local crowd, the, the roaring crowd here. 
and uh, to everybody out in the webcast land. And again, thank you to Peter Millette and um, Prostate Cancer Canada. Oh, right, yes, thank you. Uh, if One last favor, I mean, I'm not benefiting from this financially, so if you do me a favor, and that is please fill out the survey that's on the website. So go to that same webpage, healingandcancer.tv, and you'll see near the bottom of the description is press on the link to fill out the survey. And if you could please, it take you about three minutes maximum. I'd really appreciate the feedback so that we can uh, offer this uh, later on if we get good feedback from people out here. So again, have a great night and take care of yourself.